Okay. Welcome everyone to this cradle conversation. It has been quite a while since, <clears throat> since I've had one. So um, I'd like to welcome you here. Um, my name is Laura Halpin. Um, I live in Walnut Creek, California on the stolen lands of the Bay Miwok, specifically the Sacklin tribe. I use she, her pronouns. And I am really just ecstatic to invite my guest, Anya Dakota into this conversation. And so before I introduce you, I just want to say hello to you to bring you on the screen. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me, Laura. I'm so excited. We are reaching across time and space and time zones. Um, Anurata is in England. And so um, thank you for just making the time um, to, to meet with me. So Anurata and I met via the um, Facebook connections as is um, so common these days. And I have been really intrigued with her work. And so I want to just tell you a little bit about her. Um, she is um, from India, the Andhra Pradesh. Uh, oh, actually, I was born in the U.S., but yes. You were born in the U.S.? I was born in the U.S., but my parents are from Andhra, yes. Okay. So yeah, I remember the U.S. figured in. I'm I'm so sorry about that. Um, you lived in Britain and you live in Britain now. Mm -hmm. um, you were from the very early ages. You were a teacher inside and out. You mentioned how you were always kind of looking at the way that your teachers taught, and I was really intrigued by what you wrote in your bio that you as a teacher now that you're really always scanning your facilitation spaces and and teaching spaces to look at who is there who isn't there who's getting their needs met um, you have background as a lab and academic researcher you've been a classroom teacher um, an editor grant writer and also a dancer and artist and you bring all of this into your work as a business consultant where um, I wanted to read a little bit about what the Kauta Constellation does. Um, they work holistically with organizations to liberate the ingenuity, creativity and boldness that can only come from re removing the limiting factors of inequity and exploitation that are baked into so many of the normal ways that we have learned to do business and work together. So welcome. Thank you, the humbling to hear that. <laughs> Thank you. You know, it's interesting because I, I read off your website that particular line and, and the one above it that talked about how when you're working in organizations to bring out the brilliance, to point out the patterns, that you start with this assumption that structures and patterns of inequity and injustice and exclusion are baked into the organization. And you work from there. And I don't know why that sounded so, such a, it sounded like a subtle difference from what I normally hear about DE&I work because often I think that organizations are under the impression that they have skills to learn or practices to gain, but not necessarily they have to start with a structure that's already problematic. So I just wanted to, to would you be willing to comment on, on that kind of structure or how you approach your work with these organizations? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the kind of, um, as an educator and other places I worked in, the kind of honing the, this, this uh, Venn diagram, if you will, of uh, between indoctrination or the kind of education process or whatever that we've kind of uh, picked up from living in society, in this society, 
there's this biology or science component of what do what does research say? How do we understand these systems at the theoretical or other kinds of ways? And then there's a very practical element. I was a dancer, as you said, so and I'm a kinesthetic learner. So how do we integrate that into body? How do we do something with it? How do we move with it, right? Integrate and in movement work. So, um, so I, I assume, yes, we, we are going to have, we are living in a society that we are taught these things. And I also assume within that, that we're doing the best we can oftentimes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Given the information we have, given the time, given the fact that capitalism and colonialism have taught us extraction methods and uh, that it's okay to be exhausted all the time. And uh, we can exploit ourselves, each other, you know, everyone in our supply chains, you know, that, that that's part of the, the way we have to do business. And so that to me, before we get to true learning, even as a teacher, or in these organizations, the first place is kind of assessing, hey, what's going on? Let's name things. And then there may be an unlearning process um, for people who maybe have been in school, and then now are homeschooling. And this is a thing now, whether by choice, or because of circumstance, a lot more people are home educating in some way. Some there, there is, of course, I'm a home educating parent. We unschool um, uh, by choice. This was not just mm -hmm. pandemic related. And, um, but, and so there is some debate. Some homeschoolers would say, oh, they're, because they're doing in the pandemic, it's not real home education. But in my experience, education as a, as a system has only been a, a little over a hundred years that we've had mass public education. Mm -hmm. So when we actually have gone to school or gone through education, uh, us as adults or as children or what have you, and then we step out of it, there's a time, and the, the term unschooling came from John Holt's work, um, where we go through this thing called de-schooling, where mm -hmm. all that structure of, oh, that's how it used to be. Now I don't have that rigid time thing of, I have to move classes when the bell rings, I have to do homework, um, you know, and all the other things that I worked in school districts where it was a high rate of students with um, needing reduced and free lunches, right? Mm -hmm. So the, they have other struggles that we're not necessarily privy to, right? That maybe not having food at home, having a lot of domestic violence, so many things going on in their world that doesn't bring them like with the full mind ready to learn, mm -hmm. which is the way we're presenting with right. this education. So same in an organization, we, we've been working in a certain way. And there, I, I really want to hold that without judgment that that's mm -hmm, not, a, mm -hmm. not necessarily good or bad. It just is. Just is. And then once we're presented with that in some way, we maybe have this, the schooling period, this time of, oh, that's how these paradigms have impacted me. Mm -hmm. And before I take any action, I'm going to look at this from a really holistic point of view and start just naming things, noticing these things, listening to people who are our stakeholders that we maybe never bothered to hear from before. We, so there's a process depending on what, what organization and you know, the size, the, what is their, where are they struggling particularly right. that we might walk them through. And that first part is really coming back and just noticing. And in that, that's, that's a large part of the transformation that starts to happen because, oh, I does not need to be like that. Before we even start to imagine what else could be or what we're gonna change, I, do, I don't want people to just jump into, let's go change everything. Right. Um, I think we need to kind of sit with it to some degree. And in that it can be a transformative process and then we can make more longer lasting sustainable change mm -hmm. instead of let's do like let's force everyone to put pronouns in their bio and then think we've dealt with gender uh, and <laughs> the binary that's really not how it works right so that's a good starting place of I course agree. but understanding how that is working in all our processes and our hiring process in how our employee handbook is written and, and the kind of policies within the company, how we're dealing with gender for our clients or in our supply chain, or how this, um, are we addressing the fact that like 
you know, here in the global north, all of us are benefiting from um, stuff going on in the global south, right? Most of our clothing is made in sweatshop kind of conditions mm -hmm. where people are not getting a living wage. That's where most of our fast fashion comes from. Mm -hmm. And right now in the pandemic, there has been companies, big companies, making a lot of money, put in orders, the, the garment workers made the garments, and then these big companies didn't bother to pay these companies back. So then the, the supplier, those bosses now have to pay. And some of them, they're in Muslim countries or whatever. And so for the holiday period, that they expect that pay and a bonus, that's, that's mm -hmm. traditional. And so that all had to come out of those people's pockets, not, um, not the big organizations um, mm -hmm. that, so, so we can see this, we're benefiting from that in our supply chain. And we can maybe start to think what are ways we can sustainably, iteratively keep approaching this and bringing that gender equality because most of those people uh, in the global South doing that kind of work are women um, mm -hmm. or other gender minorities. Mm -hmm. What do you think, it's just so interesting to think about your experience that you were a lab researcher, you know, so you were starting with like minutia, I would imagine, right? <laughs> and its impact on a larger question, maybe. Um, so I think that's really interesting that you bring that kind of slow, tedious, repetitive work to this, you know, systems work, you know, that's really interesting to me. And I also think it's so interesting that as a performer and dancer, you understand like that, not understand, but you live with the, the importance of that kinesthetic, you know, the, the repetition of just physical practice too. Mm -hmm. So, and then as a teacher, it just, it's really like a magical combination of skills that you bring. Um, yeah. Um, before we get started with the cradle questions, um, I wanted to ask you about your program, Sowing the Seeds of Capitalism. Could you yeah, just yeah. say something briefly about that? Because I think, Absolutely. you know, you, you've used a word, you use the word extractive or extraction, and in your as you talk about it, could you use that again? Because I don't think that there's a lot of people that talk about extraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so the course is called Sowing Post-Capitalist Seeds. Okay. And my- Not uh, Sowing the Seeds of Capitalism. Yeah, that's all right. That sounds like a good <laughs> title too. Yes. <laughs> it's just slightly different, um, but it was, it, it's, it's not just mine. Um, my co-facilitator, Mariah Helms, and I envisioned this together. We basically, how it started, I'll just give you this story of, which is kind of against that extraction, um, that she um, had heard about my work and wanted to support it at the time when we met, I was working with um, South, not just South Asian, but Asian diasporic individuals to do our work around that identity, because that's a large part of my work of undoing that indoctrination on who we are and who we're meant to be and, and the work we're doing in the world. That's, that's the kind of place that I spend a lot of my time. And so she wanted to, she teaches yoga. And as you know, she, so that's uh, Dharmic art from South Asia. And it's, um, many, many Dharma, Dharmic traditions have, have had some input in the yoga, um, in, in the different forms. So she wanted to give back. So she tied the portion of her income from teaching this yoga, uh, Ashtanga yoga, and she wanted to give it. And she, she basically gave enough to support one or two scholarships for people to be in this space with me to work on their identity work. And wow. she really wanted to give that back to South Asian diasporic people. Mm -hmm. That was her wish. And so that's how we started talking. And then I said, okay, why don't we start having a regular conversation? Um, and then 
in a year, after a year of talking, we created this course and we've run it a few times now and it's a 14 week journey. And the, when we're talking about that extraction, well, the way yoga is um, a 90 some billion dollar industry just in the US. And these are our sacred arts, meaning there's lineage holders who've had this wisdom, who've protected it and tended it over the years and passing it down. I don't, I'm not a yoga, I'm not in a yoga lineage, but I'm in a Bharatanatyam and I'm in a dance lineage. And so, you know, being part of that lineage holder, um, for whatever we want to protect the art and but instead what you see with yoga and with any other um, indigenous art around the world we see similar patterns the, that a there's an orientalist trope about how do we view it so with colonial gaze of the you know um, so that that I'm not going to get into but mm -hmm. there's also this story of extraction so that means a lot of the people in the yoga space who are talking about it who are profiting from it who are writing books about it are white people mm -hmm. who it's not from their tradition and they learn that wisdom from teachers or whoever and and probably some of them have done it in the correct spirit and, and that can be done one of my dance teachers is Johanna Hangel Darcy and she is from Finland Mm -hmm. So, you know, it can be done and she has such reverence for the art and she's tending it in that way. If it's done in that spirit, I'm happy. It doesn't matter to me who does it. Mm -hmm. But often we're seeing this extraction where then they, they gatekeep and not allow South Asian lineage holders the space. They're not sending money to those organizations or to those leaders. And you're not going to see like my Bharatanatyam dance teacher in India uh, Pasumarthi Ramalinga Sastri, you're not going to see him on Instagram, you know, showing his uh, dance, you know, what his latest dance creation, he's not going to, that's not the kind of situation we're in. These lineage holders are very much, you know, doing their thing in these really important ways, passing on this, these traditions and um, to their students and through performance and keeping the art, art alive and struggling with low funds, just like artists around the world, right? The same situation is there. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's a form of extraction. In this 14 week journey, we first, the first half, we or the first little bit, we talk a little, we take a deep dive into how capitalism and colonialism, how it got going, where it's the roots, especially here in Europe, how did that start? And then the second half of the course, we kind of work in community to come up with our own praxis that liberates us. So what is a post-capitalist practice that might work for us as an individual? And um, so it's, it's, it's that kind of rich lens that we're bringing. And we have guest speakers and it's just an amazing community. And um, I'm just blessed to have such a great um, a wise um, co co teacher who herself she lives in Maine and she works with the indigenous people in that part of the world and you know just so we're bringing these rich voices in terms of land um, relationship with land relationship with each other relationship with money relationship with spiritual so we bring some spiritual practice into you know some some small rituals in we you know so we bring we bring from a lot of fields uh, talk about labor and um, other ways of collectivizing power and resources and other forms of capital besides just money I mean we, we have rich discussions in many areas it sounds so interesting and what I think is fascinating and so important is that, you know, capitalism seems larger than life. It seems like, you know, it's part of that water that we're swimming in. And so to take something that feels so kind of unapproachable and bringing it back to this body, these decisions, my relationship with money, um, how did I get here? You know, mm -hmm. I just think is really, it's, it's so powerful. I want to sign up. <laughs> We'd be lucky to have you, Lori. <laughs> so, so good. 
Okay, so thank you for all of that. I feel like it's so important. Well, it's just information, you know, it's just part of your story. And so I really appreciate you sharing sharing that. Um, we have no idea who is going to be listening in to this conversation, but I just wanted to say hello to whoever is going to be watching this across time and space and to also just call them close that the one of the reasons for being this this cradle conversation is to create connection um, especially in this time of isolation but isolation that was really there even before covid you know it's just gotten more extreme and and i i just really value what can shift just through an authentic conversation, you know, and, and so I just want to call everyone close, um, welcome them into this conversation, welcome them to connect with us and to open themselves up to whatever ideas that come from this conversation and how it might shift things in their space. Um, so really appreciative to people who want to connect with us. Um, so the cradle conversations have five, five questions and um, they really are about trying to tap into the mind and spirit of people who seem to be in this time of radical shift out a little bit further, you know, who have made the leap mm -hmm. with their life practices and their thought life. And so the really important questions of, to find out, you know, where you are, what your practices are, because we can, um, we can learn from you, you know, and, um, and I really appreciate your presence here. So the first question is what cradles you? Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, whatever practice or belief or mantra, um, anything that holds you steady. Mm. That's such a good question. Um, that's a very difficult one at times for me because it feels like since this time feels like such a moving target moving conversation that what maybe have worked uh, even a couple months ago is no longer working. Yes. And it very much is, at least for me, tapping into this present moment, tapping into, like you said, the body and what is needed, what is what's present right now and listening to that. So at this moment, and it might shift again in a few mm -hmm. days, um, I, I kind of jotted down a few notes before we got um got together and you know laughter is such a big one right now finding joy in um like just normal um normal things that are funny um uh, or things that i find amusing or lovely like i've been watching these videos of cats and dogs <laughs> And they have, and they have buttons like that. You can train them to talk using these little buttons. And so they're having come. So the owners in during pandemic or perhaps before pandemic have made it their mission to kind of bring some of these words into the house and use them and then show them how to use these buttons. And so you're watching these adults, um, you know, humans and these animals connecting and talking about whatever right with yes. these words and I just find it so beautiful because I think that where there's life you know we have this kind of sentient energy and mm -hmm. we do want to communicate um, with each other we want to be understood we want to be heard and I love that and and the other kind of place, which I don't think I would have said three or four years ago that it would be so powerful is the voice of the voices of the ancestors or my ancestors, mm -hmm. you know, that there's, they're bringing a lot of guidance and a lot of um, just support energy um, 
perhaps guidance in, in some cases, but mostly just kind of come, you know, in the early morning hours when I am unable to sleep, I, I feel their presence, mm -hmm. you know, so that's been a comfort. For one, I just want to comment that I think in all of the conversations that I've had, I don't think anyone's mentioned laughter. And <laughs> really, <laughs> I don't think so. And, and so I just think that, you know, it, it, it's such a heavy time, you know, it's such a heavy time with so much fear. And so I really appreciate you just highlighting it can be as simple as a cat video and that can be that can that's real you know that <laughs> I love that thank you and I also wanted to ask you in your mention of the uh, the guidance of your ancestors and hearing the voices of your ancestors is that is that a practice that you have cultivated or do you just energetically feel them closer than they've been in previous times in, in your life? It's mostly through cultivation, through regular, making regular kind of, just like how would you relate to um, somebody else? Um, a corporeal being, you know, the, you know, in body, how, how would you relate with them? You would get to know what they like to perhaps give an offering or a gift, you know, um, listen to what they have to say, you know, share something of yourself, right? That kind of back and forth, it's a practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other part is they have a lot to say because we are reckoning with some big things, right? Uh, across the globe that some, a lot of which is the colonial garbage that we have not reckoned with um, and here in Britain, especially in a post-Brexit world, like I was talking to a South Asian diasporic person who is uh, British here, and we were both kind of lamenting on the amount of racism, um, especially towards South Asian communities here since, since the Brexit vote. And you know, so how that how this is coming up again in the rhetoric right now of keeping people out of the country and um, the way they want to treat refugees and putting them similar to an uh, similar to how they do it in Australia, where refugees and asylum seekers are put on some island which is very far away from the mainland and they're kind of chained up there, you know, left there to you know. So that, that practice is what they're trying to bring here in England. So if we're not reckoning with that's the kind of rhetoric and this is the kind of situation of, of several hundred years of colonial violence and that we still, we, we, we have the gall to say <coughs> we're in a post-colonial time. And it's like, no, we're still very much in real-time colonialization that hasn't stopped. It's not in the past. Right. And we're not, we're not reckoning with it. So mm -hmm. I think there's a push um, this, in this time that we perhaps can shift. The, the, there's potential for shift, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Barrington Salmon, I don't know. Have you ever met Barrington Salmon? He no, is, um, uh, he is, Jamaican, he's a, um, he's a journalist and he talks a lot about, about his relationship with ancestors. And one of the things that has come up in our conversations is just how, and I've noticed this throughout the cradle conversations is that so often the, um, the people of color who I interview have have that sense of connection both to the ancestors, their ancestors and generations that will come after them. And I think that, and I'm not saying that that doesn't exist for white folks, but I just know that it doesn't often come up this sense of, you know, the seven generations or that I have 
I come from people and I, <laughs> and I have an obligation both to them and who is, is coming. And so it's not surprising that you bring that in, but it's always very, um, it's super meaningful for me to hear that you are, that you cultivate a relationship um, in your day to day and that it's so meaningful and grounding for you. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Okay, so the second question is, how do you rock the cradle? And the idea is that, you know, we need something to hold us, but we also are held by systems that we need to dismantle. And so that's a, a nice way of saying, you know, what, what is it that you do that, that shakes up the systems? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, as I kind of mentioned before, my work is around identity. So how did indoctrination in all of these ways shape us? And, um, and how do we like un undo some of that indoctrination? How do we get back into motion like, in terms of integrating what's going on? So we might see organizations at this point if they've, if they've been paying attention and making some commitment, we might see a Black Lives Matter statement or they might be um, think, reassessing their acceptability during this time of pandemic for their employees or for their um, customers or both, right? Or we might see um, maybe mental health being addressed, right? So, so I think this, this unique time we're in is pushing a lot of those um, how do we how do we do this? How do we meet this challenge? How do we be resilient in this time of change? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I I say that's a good start. And I also think it's not nearly far enough because so much of how we how how di um, diversity and so on is in the '60s, like when when diversity was kind of first coming out in the way that we see it now that that time period when that's coming out it, it becomes very much about you now you're you're setting me up to teach uh, which is good <laughs> but all it's not let me just put it this way diversity in and of itself is not far enough and it actually doesn't change the system. And in fact, diversity measures are not meant to change the system. If we're looking at mm -hmm. um, the kind of pyramid structure, this, the, the systemic oppression and how it is. So we have more diverse people in the higher groups, but it, um, like for Congress, you have something called a quorum, which is the num minimum number of individuals needed to be there to conduct business, correct? Mm -hmm. um, bacteria have this, they have quorum sensing. So this is where I bring in the biology. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's good. I'm glad my nerdiness <laughs> has a use at times. Um, but these, these bacteria can quorum sense. They can do a kind of mini census in a given moment say, hey, are there enough of us to go cause trouble, do this, whatever we're gonna do, do our agenda. If they don't, then they, they are below threshold, they don't do it. Mm -hmm. If they're above threshold, they can carry on. Well, what happens with most diversity measures say like, oh, now we have some people of color, we have some people with marginalized, other marginalized you know, identities. We, we, that diversity measure, increases the number, but it doesn't give enough of a quorum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what it does is it puts people, and I'm gonna talk about this on one of your other questions a little bit more, but it puts people in this awkward position of kind of, especially marginalized individuals to kind of speak up and do things that would actually be more harmful mm -hmm. to their own groups their own the not to say we're all one group and we all have one thought because it's certainly not the case I, I'm just saying broadly um, we see this here in the UK with the Tory party we've we have several people of color on the um, in the cabinet or that are more of the right wing Tory MPs 
and some of them are people of color and saying really vitriolic things, i.e. like Preeti Patel here saying that basically she, she's the she's the home secretary and um, blocking immigration so that even her parents who were immigrants couldn't now she's pulling up the ladder so even her own family couldn't have come over um, and saying really hateful things. So I'm not saying here, I don't feel any sympathy for her. I wanna make that 100% clear. I do not agree with her in any way, shape or form, but that's something that I think is a way that I, I like to shake things up um, mm -hmm. is to be able to speak that truth and say, mm -hmm. diversity isn't enough. We need to reimagine the system at all. So it's not like, do I at home educate? Do I educate? Um, like that is that that's the kind of question or like, oh, should we get free broadband to teach or should we have online or whatever? That's the kind of way where I know I'm jumping around. I'm not a linear thinker, but it will make no, sense. I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> These are very binary questions that yes. limit the discussion. But yes. I want to say, what if we extend, well, like, what if we shifted that whole paradigm around education? We've yes. only had public education for a little over 100 years in the US. That was Mother Jones doing a lot of work and other activists to stop child labor. Mm -hmm putting in that legislation and and so on lobbying for change um, before that kids would have chances for like apprenticeships if they were working class they would have gone and learned a trade and so on in, in so many parts of the world right in in our lineage you maybe go learn with a guru and learn you know live with them that that you become a part of their household and you contribute to their household and you learn this skill Mm -hmm. um, so we have so many other ways we can approach education that it doesn't need to be this formal education inside a classroom. So we want to shift that paradigm. So the yeah. paradigm that we're living in in business is this paradigm of extraction of that we must, that, that we have to work super hard and, you know, that we need to focus only on profit and bottom line and yeah. all of these other pieces that we're told, right? Mm -hmm. um, and instead we can say, what if our organization brought in a community of care for people in the organization or the people who, who shop with us or work with us in some way? What if we paid living wages and so on? What if we made it so that we actually understood the needs of the people showing up or the peace, people who wanna show up to whatever we're doing? either who are already there or who would like to be a participant. And so they can actually do something, contribute, right? So how do we define work? How do we define contribution? Um, you know, are we making things in a way that is accessible, but not, not, to, not to, so to the extreme where then we exploit ourselves, that we right. have to overwork, right? That we have right. to work 70, 80 hours to get that, that's not that's that's a type of exploitation that I see a lot too that we yes. maybe, we'll do it ourselves we'll take on too many hours so I'm just saying that I want I challenge not just one or two of these little pieces but I want to challenge the entire system itself within us I, I so hear that you know like in everything that you've said you're looking at you're looking at the much bigger, deeper picture. And so it's almost like your impatience with the band-aids is the way that you, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're like, not the band-aid, it's the infection, right? Okay. <laughs> you know, you want to work at that infection level and, and yeah, and shift that. I like that idea of the bacteria in the quorum that there's not, there's not enough to shift the environment if there's not that, that broader thinking. Mm -hmm. So good. And, and I just think- we, we put these band-aids as, oh, as if, yes, we've ticked some boxes, we've done a good job. And, and that's a good place to start, right. but yeah. it's not the place we end. Like that's just the beginning of the conversation as far as I'm concerned. Right, because we're working on like, policy, which, you know, often is like the low hanging fruit where it is kind of box checky that is impactful, but mm -hmm. we're also working from like, this isn't going to get here, you know, it may be a step. So interesting. 
Okay. All right. Yeah, and, and can I just illustrate what that may be? Because I can hear in my head people asking, what would that look like? Okay. So what would that yes. look like is in in um in um organization we might say, you know, we're gonna deal with um more diversity in our hiring. And, and so we can actually look, track our metrics and so on, but to actually look at then how we change things in a, in a deeper way, we start bringing in where we, um, in the UK, this is now becoming more standard. You know, it, it's not, it's, I don't think it's legislated upon, mm -hmm. but I think it's becoming more industry standard where we cover up um, identifying information on a CV. And we have, um, so the, the hiring process itself becomes more open. So we're not, so because, because here in the UK or in Europe, European statistics, the, the number of people who have foreign sounding names mm -hmm. won't get, um, I mean, the, 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 the statistics are staggering of how many more applications 50 to 70 percent depending on the industry more applications that a person of color with that kind of name or even here there's a lot of resentment even of other Europeans so let's say Eastern European kind of names that they would have to apply more to get a position mm -hmm. so how do we systemically change that yes we we you know look at hiring practice and so on but we also start to implement these bigger changes right of you start changing training. the lenses right yeah. you know that's right that's right yeah. how do we how do we bring these bigger changes how do we do this at a systemic level and that means sometimes airing grievances leveling pay instead of um you know where because we see that right um when they start looking at, oh my gosh we're actually paying some people significantly less even though they may be in the same position so we start to level the playing field by attacking or by, by bringing light to these and mm -hmm. creating change mm -hmm. and that becoming very transparent that this is what we're doing and um and you know that the, um bringing in not just policy, like you said, but actually action at all of these levels. Mm -hmm. And the reason is not only because it's the right thing, the humane thing, the way to build a connected business culture where mm -hmm. everyone is belongs and is valued, but I know that it's also profitable. It makes sense, <laughs> you know, oh, like absolutely. you miss out on brilliance when you- There's statistic after statistic yeah. that, that prove exactly what you're saying. Yes. If that's people of color, if that's people with disabilities, if that's neurodivergent, you know, that you're missing ideas, you're missing things that keep you, right? So, because we're seeing so many companies misstep right now and not just by a little bit, like massively misstepping. Well, that's, I mean, that's going to have an impact, not just on bottom line, but culture, like who's going to yeah. want to work at an organization like that, right? Um, th that this is not the kind of situation that, you know, and, and I'm seeing this too, can it be performative? Absolutely. And I'm seeing some of that too. Oh, now it's time to say Black Lives Matter, but I wouldn't address racism before. So, you know, there's, there's some, there's many things that happen. It's very mm -hmm. fluid and it's, you know, we want to look deeper, obviously. Mm -hmm. This is where we would do an audit to see, hey, what's going on? I have a friend whose husband is um, in charge of diversity, equity, and inclusion for a very large company. And the CEO, the priority for the D D and I work is um, one of them is marketing. You know, so again, like, just this idea that it's all like forward facing performative as opposed to how are we making our decisions and who's at the table. So, yeah. um, okay, so the third question is, huh, in this time where I'm sure you are struggling with depletion and exhaustion and anxiety, do you have a cradle to offer us? That is a big question. Um, and as you see, I don't give brief answers of. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
these aren't like these aren't multiple choice questions so i know what i'm getting myself into select a laura um oh, just kidding um <laughs> just being silly um yeah i jotted down that a cradle piece that is within our what's in our sphere of influence what's in our sphere of concern and these are terms from seven habits of highly effective people right so there is a circle of concern but then there's also a circle of influence where can we create change because there is a way to create that change and so feel the feel take care of yourself the best you can and um, and, and all of those pieces and look to where can I, like with my resources, how can I prioritize? How can I put them to use in a way that is more impactful? And it doesn't need to be more impactful than any other person in the world or whatever. It might be, and, and this is what I love about, I used to be a track uh, athlete. I used to run track and field when I was in high school we had something called a PR or a PB, like a personal record or a personal best. I want you to not be running this race with every person in the world, right? right? I want you to be running it like you iteratively. I did X last year and that was yeah. right. And then what can I do this year? And really look at your circumstance. Like if you don't have financial things to give, like some organizations don't have that. Is there labor, or other things you could do? Is there awareness work? Is there amplification? Is there, you know, um, Deepa Kyer, I believe her. I, yes, I Deepa Iyer. Yes. Yeah, Iyer, Iyer, there you go. Yes, she provides a beautiful framework of different ways we can get involved, right? So what, which, which aspects are we here to work on? Can you where can you use your influence in those ways? And then not go from zero to a million, but how can I take an incremental mm -hmm. kind of movement? Right. right. I love that framework. I'm so happy that you're familiar with it. And I really do. I think that that comparison, you know, we see somebody who's, you know, doing the big things and it, makes us feel inadequate or discouraged or overwhelmed from doing the things that are right in front of us. And so, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, that is a really interesting idea. And I've never heard, maybe I know I've read the seven habits mm -hmm. years and years ago, but the circle of concern being different from the circle of influence, that's mm -hmm. super interesting. Thank you. Um, so the fourth question is, do you have um, something to offer this community of listeners in terms of how we can become more skilled at rocking the cradle? And that is, you know, disrupting the systems of whether it be capitalism, anti-racism, um, white supremacy culture. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is such a good question. I have so much to say. You might have to, you know, <laughs> like, remind me of time if I get okay. if I get too too excited here. I wrote some interesting notes. Um, well, the way I answer this question is in so I have a as you know biochemistry kind of framework and and a rhetorical framework, right? So that was later in my work. Um, that I'm bringing to this. And one of the places I like to start is naming our bias and, and, and our identity. Like, where are we? We wanna ground in something. Let's ground in who we are. Let's ground in our story, our, and so on. So as you said, my family is from Andhra. Well, my mom's side is from Telangana and my dad's side is from Andhra because the state has split. So understanding that this, that, the, the history of the state, my parents, now two states my parents came from and the history of what, what was going on at the time of partition in India and the time of, um, and that uh, was not just at the Northern border that people talk about um, 
the separation of the Muslim state and Hindu state. It, it impacted so many places. And in Hyderabad, uh, which is now part of Telangana, that, that had Muslim rulership for four centuries or something. So quite a long time, three centuries, I, I don't know. Um, but quite a long, so long time that they've had that influence. And so there was um, disputes and things going on in that area as well. There was some hiccups going on. So then going back even further back generations, what do we start to learn about our land and, that sto and the stories? And in my master's work, I, I actually looked at, it was in rhetoric, if people really care. It's something we don't study in England, but it's something that is rooted in pedagogy, so education, and it's understanding how we influence, right? So those, mm -hmm. at its heart, that's what rhetoric is. And in that work, I looked at how did the British colonization, how did that shift Bharatanatyam? How did it shift this storytelling dance? How did it, so there was a huge shift during colonization from a temple art to a stage art, from a low caste art, that there was the lower castes who were primarily doing it. Now it's primarily an upper caste art. So how that, 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 that mechanism happened, how it became a nationalistic, a symbol of nationalism, that budding nationalism in India, how that was tied up with India's understanding of who we are. And now we still use Bharatanatyam classes around the world to, um, to teach about Indianness. And some of those stories are not telling the truth about colonization or or some of the uglier, not so beautiful parts of our history. Um, and, and some of the policies we've taken with us, right? There's a lot of casteism that goes around worldwide in Indian or South Asian diasporic groups. So what I, and, and also, um, and also <laughs> if we look at how colonization happened, and this is why I'm saying I'm, I'm naming it from a South Asian mm -hmm. diasporic person's perspective. And I want you to do that homework and understand where, whoever you are, whatever your story, that these are some of the threads that we must weave together to figure out our positionality in the world. Mm -hmm. And so one of these other pieces is how, especially the British, they would have the, so they brought the enslaved and then they brought workers um, from all over Asia and they were often called coolies. Um, so, so South Asian, often laborers, but it could be from anywhere in Asia. I wanna make that point really clear, were brought. So you see this hierarchy of three groups, white um, kind of colonizers. And then we have these brown people, i.e. Um, South Asian or Asian, worker, labor class, and then you have the actual enslaved. So you see this hierarchy, and this is from where the model minority was born. Mm -hmm. So we all, non-white people, are facing, uh, you know, the colonialism and racism and so on. Mm -hmm. But my positionality will say, in one hand, yes, I share that. So I should be in solidarity. I want to be in solidarity with that. And, and some of the movements even here in Britain, which is not so popular, but they would call it politically black. And that, that term got, because of the colonial divide and conquer, that, that kind of term is not, has come out of use, but mm -hmm. it was acting in solidarity. And then we also have this wedge phenomenon that Asians have been or some South Asian groups, you know, so this model minority of creating this group, uh, this divide between black populations and white populations. Mm -hmm. So, oh, they're the model minority, they're mm -hmm. smarter, they're whatever, mm -hmm. um, pull themselves up, whatever this kind of nonsense. And so on one hand, yes, I can understand that um, marginalization that I face, but on the other hand, I have a lot of privilege. I'm lighter skinned. Um, I am, come from a higher caste. And so I have to use these things and I have to weaponize them in ways to um, help, help our movement move forward. So, it's, it's, it, so that's one of the pieces I can challenge because almost anybody, except if we're talking about the top 1% and the lowest 1%, everybody in the middle has some degree of of um, 
of privilege and marginalization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So finding out, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Okay, so, so what you're offering just as a midway point, because I, I can tell that you have more as a, as a midway point that one of the ways that we become more skilled at disrupting um, white supremacy culture is that we get more skilled at understanding and naming our positionality. So that may be able-bodied or white or uh, college educated or second language, you know, whatever, whatever it is. So, okay. Is that, is that what you? So naming it, understanding that it's, it's complex, mm -hmm. that it's not going to be pure. Like we're looking for, I'm just 100% privileged or I'm one. And it's, it's that, that doesn't, that dynamic doesn't exist for most people. I would say mm -hmm. most of the population is kind of somewhere in the middle that we're going to have a little bit of both. And um, like you said, naming that is a good place to start, but mm -hmm. then learning how we can use that for good, right? <laughs> so not being silent about it, meaning, mm -hmm. um, so, so there's so many places that we can play with that. And I think social media is such a leveling field that it allows so many more of us to teach and to, or I say teach, but share our stories, be mm -hmm. in conversation, right? So we just, it's um, as flawed as social media is. I think that's some, that's a really powerful tool that we have in our hands. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned, you use the word storytelling, you know, and I think that that is changing, shifting the stories that we tell, I think is so, it's so powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Is there more? Well, here's the thing. In my master's work, one of the kind of conclusions I came to was we're told, hey, here's the here's the headline, here's the banner, here's mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. right, here's the board, like the bill, bill billboard that says mm -hmm. this is how it is. And we're given a very Im a image of what that should be, like what our body should look like, what we should be thinking, what should we be saying, doing, whatever that's kind of dictated to us in so many ways. And how do we start to reclaim ourselves? is and and how do we understand this narrative these narratives that it's not let me now rip, you know take this marginalized story and put it front and center and that's the story mm -hmm. because that's kind of what colonialism did they actually sent postcards of their servants or of the enslaved or so on and they sent these pictures home to Britain like this is a this is a thing that's where colonial gaze comes from so we still have that vestige of now we're going to put on what we so so the way my dance would be framed would be it, it seems really you know um let's just say it's not professional like ballet mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's not the way people would view my dance in fact I got, I've gotten criticism as a dancer oh why don't you know another thing like ballet and I'm like because mm -hmm. I don't I don't want to learn on a Western <laughs> style. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'm happy with what I, the lineage holders, what they, what I've been taught. Um, but so even that positionality. So what I, my solution is collecting and learning more about this. So we get a fuller picture. So mm -hmm. what we're told is that this is how colonization is, or this is my experience of it. We actually start listening to so many different voices and this is where the narrative, storytelling, teaching, all, all sorts of things, we get a fuller picture. So the more I learn about um, Asian diaspora in the world and the various, like just little pieces, oh, somebody talks a little bit here. And then I learned about this Korean board game here. I'm not Korean, mm -hmm. but I found, and it's like, oh, this is cool. And then this, and, and we just get this really rich tapestry of, oh, it's not one person and one answer. Mm -hmm. And same within your organization, you taking what some other organization and copying what they're doing is not going to cut it. You mm -hmm. actually, this is your chance to remake this, uh, this tapestry of the richness of what your organization stands for, who is all the individuals in the room. Right. 
Right. What are your visions? Who are you really? And what do you stand for? That's, this is the kind of place where you can create something more alchemical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it goes back to that, that circle of influence, right? And the quorum. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Um, the last question is, do you have a blessing or a vision or hope for the collective? And I feel like, you know, everything that you've said, you're communicating that, but. Yeah, I'm just looking at my notes and I think I said the piece about using our sphere of influence, like Mm -hmm. social media being a boon. That's, that's one of the pieces I really wanted to give. And also that in this, you're not alone. It might feel like it. And, and maybe you do feel alone and that is okay. You're feeling, feel that feeling definitely. And there's so many other people, like there is, um, there's so many more people who want the change that you're seeking as well. And we can, we need to be in conversation or something in some way. I mean, I don't know. I know it's very difficult and I'm trying to give a broad message to so many different types of people, but I do want to say with um, that we never got change. We never got our rights like weekends or right to vote or any of these things that we have currently enjoy. Um, We didn't get it without a fight. Mm -hmm. So we're standing on the shoulders of giants Mm -hmm. and, you know, we are going to keep coming together to do this, to, Mm -hmm. to continue to push for further change. Yeah. So it really is like working, you know, seeing, seeing ourselves as part of a larger picture. You know, we were talking about that before Mm -hmm. and that, And, and part of a fabric, you know, that, that we really are, it's so easy to feel isolated or discouraged, especially because of the storytelling, you know, especially because of the headlines and how like not nuanced they are and how frightening they are. And I think that that's one of the reasons that I so value this conversation or the cradle conversations are just conversations with people with such brilliant imaginations that is healing for me. That makes me feel less alone. That makes me feel more helpful, you know, hopeful. And so I just want to kind of go back to, and I want to kind of call everybody close back. Like, let's get grounded back in this, like the main messages of this conversation as, as I took them away is that the, just the suggestion to be cradled by levity and laughter and joy and those simple pleasures that they really can accumulate, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and to cultivate a, a relationship, a listening and responsive relationship with our ancestors. As you said, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Mm-hmm. And to tap into that love and wisdom. Um, the, the ways that you rock the cradle are, is, again, looking at the, the bigger questions, the paradigm, as opposed to, like, the measurable fixes. Um, the cradle you offered was about seeing yourself identifying your circle of of influence and by measuring yourself only, not even against yourself, but it's not a comparative, it's not a race, it's looking at your capacities and your circumstances. Mm -hmm. Um, And the the way to become more skilled at at rocking the the cradle would be to really understand our own positionality. And by seeing our own positionality, we become more skilled at seeing others and 
perceiving it in others, right? Mm -hmm. um, That's a pretty good sorry. summary. Of Is very there um, complex things? Well done. <laughs> um, this was such an interesting conversation, you know, and again, like where I started was just kind of a fascination at all of the threads of your life and how they all are coming to play in your work right now, I think is really, really interesting. Um, one of the things that I can't remember where on your website it was, but you mentioned um, the importance of like enzymes or catalysts to create change. And, and I just really, I love that that's who you are. And I also love that that's your suggestion here is that we can, we're not responsible for the, <laughs> you know, everything that happens, but we can be a catalyst in our circle of influence. Yeah, absolutely. And I got to study enzymes, but somehow I got really, enzymes are protein catalysts, so specific to biological systems. Um, so that's what the difference is. But yes, I got to study catalysts. How are they working in a, in a system, right? That's what we're looking at. How are they changing the system? And they don't, they don't change it by changing the elements themselves. They don't go, you know, they, they, what they do is they make the change more ease, more easeful. They bring together all the necessary groups and they make the chances of that reaction happen with a lot less energy putting into that system. That's what they do. And so what if that's we could just so brilliant run away before we get into action? Like that's what I want all of us to do, shorten that runway and work with what we have, work with who's around us, right? Work with that truth. What would that look like instead of I'm going to take a long time to make the, it's going to take decades to make this change. Well, that might be true, but we can also start by doing something now. Gosh, I feel like you could riff on the whole metaphor of enzymes for a long time. That's probably so good. Could, yes. So good. So um, I want to thank you so much for just trusting me with your time and your gifts and ideas. It's been so lovely to have this time with you. Really appreciate it. Um, likewise, Laura, likewise, thank you so much. And I will, as I share this cradle conversation, I'll be sharing your opportunities, um, your offerings for learning and growth, which I think are so important and so timely. It must feel so good to have offerings that are medicinal for this moment. I hope so. I, I will say I am nervous and I also think it's time that we really focus in the, like the, that just like I need to take my own medicine here and say, I'm gonna catalyze because that's what I'm here to work on now. That's the project in front of me right now. That's yeah. bringing hope and life, yeah. So thank you. And um, I look forward to talking with you soon. Yes, thank you so much, Laura.